Hey guys, before we get into this episode, I just want to let you know, I did have an issue with recording Zoom on my end, so uh, of course I did, and of course we get two hours into the interview, I end it, and I find that out. So, it will be set up properly for part two, uh, coming in a couple of weeks from when you guys listen to this, but just want to let you know, there's a the audio quality could be a little bit better, it's not up to uh, what I would like it to be. Not up to par to what I would like it to be, but uh, it, there is some like cutting in and out of my audio quality being Zoom recording and then into my nice recording through my mic. But don't worry, this is a great episode. You still won't want to miss it. Um, and part two will definitely sound a little bit better. But without further ado, I would like to introduce Darren Bruce on this episode of Electronic Dance Money. Hey guys, welcome to Electronic Dance Money, your number one business resource for making money as electronic musicians and producers. up everyone welcome back to another episode of electronic dance money i'm your host christian casito and we're here with another guest you guys are lucky enough because this is going to be the second week in a row that you guys get a guest and i've got darren bruce of the dj sessions on and we're going to be talking a little bit about kind of everything that has to do with live streaming i guess we're going to be getting into some copyright stuff because that is kind of that's big news as of recently that is blowing up the industry. So uh, we're going to be answering or we're going to I guess we're just going to be diving into that topic because I even have some questions. But Darren, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being on. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the DJ sessions? What are you guys doing there? I'm sure pro- there's got to be a couple of people who have heard of the DJ sessions before. Well, uh, maybe a couple. <laughs> like two or three in in a, in a country somewhere that I can't pronounce, you know. Maybe I'm like that, you know. But no, uh, thank you for having us on the show. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I'm really excited for this uh, opportunity. And um, yeah, I mean, the DJ sessions is a series, an online DJ live streaming series that started in late 2009, um, based upon an idea that I had that came away uh, that was a kind of takeaway from an online series. That I, a broadcast television series that was on NBC at the time uh, locally that was approved to air on 12 stations with eight separate television shows on the West Coast um, called ITV. And in 2009, I, I got into live streaming after having a good successful run in 2005 with our podcast series um, being listed in iTunes, doing hundreds of thousands of downloads, literally millions of downloads of that, um, all stemming from going backwards to our production our broadcast television production days of putting ITV on, on the air. And, and that was um, a, you were getting millions of streams in 2009. Oh, we were getting millions of streams in 2005. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, the progression, I kind of went a little bit backwards there going where we're at currently going backwards, but mm-hmm. yeah, actually uh, I started podcast. Well, we started in broadcast. Te- I started in broadcast television. Actually, I started in public access television in 1992. And um, going all the way back then and working with a, a show called The Cool Out Network, which is a local hip hop television show that was produced here in Seattle, you know, the only distribution medium that we had was public access, unless you could afford the $50,000 cameras to make it broadcast quality ready to go on, mm-hmm. you know, the network stations. And then you had to buy your time in order to get on the stations. And that was just not feasible for a local independent producer because we're still using VHS cameras at the time and <clears throat> and editing facilities for that were just the arm of the leg you know so it just wasn't feasible but we had public access and i did that for about eight years had a ba- had a chance to work on a, a a pilot series for a broadcast television show here in seattle it was a late night talk show it was a pretty good concept pretty good idea and and kind of got the bug under my skin to say you know what this is what i want to do with my life this is what i want to happen i want to produce shows i want to my goal, a lot of people don't go out there and say, I want to be the next Aaron Spelling or I want to be the Mike, next Michael Michael Lawrence, if you, if you know those names. Um, most people in this game, when they pick up a camera, 
or they go into the industry. They want to go into the movie industry. They want right. to make films. They want to be that Spielberg or that Lucas or that Scorsese or that you know Kubrick. They want to go for those kind of gold. And I was kind of like, I like television. You know, I like the quickness of it, the, the, the storytelling. You can tell the what you're capturing and, and the kind of the mentoring that I got working on the Kulat cool Network, in a sense, got me involved in being out there on the street with the hip hop artists, whether they were A-list celebrities or local um, hip hop artists and, and DJs and kind of featuring them. So you could say that my, my series, when I got into my first series, Phantasmagoria, which was with Fox, exec at the Fox, you know, um, it featured, I mean, we didn't have a show concept. I only had a title of a name. And I kind of give you a little bit of the history of how this all unravels to move the clock all the way forward to 2020 in the future. But um, I didn't have an idea except for the fact that I had a name for the show and I had my first ever short film that I had filmed called um, Metamorphosis in college. And I said, you know what? I got an idea. Why don't I put my short film in the show? And then, okay, I got one episode, but I needed 13 for a season. And I said, well, why don't I get other students in the class and reach out to other places? and get their short films, and then do a show called Phantasmagoria, which featured short films by independent producers. That turned into also doing some sports segments. It turned into doing some nightlife segments, and Phantasmagoria then morphed into Phantasmagoria, Image Nightlife, and Northwest Extreme Sports. And this is back in 2002, 2003-ish. Again, the only mediums for distribution were public access and broadcast television. And not that public access is a bad medium. I just had vowed to myself, I will be on broadcast television. Mm -hmm. I will get there and have my name with a Fox, NBC, somewhere. So um, we, we've made the pilot series. And when I sat back and was looking at all three shows, this kind of puts the way clock up to um, after we had aired on Fox with Phantasmagoria, puts the way clock up to about 2004, 2005-ish. We got some offices in Pioneer Square. And I sat down with the producer I brought on at the time and realized I didn't want to have to get a website made for each show, logos made for each show, branding made for each show, t-shirts, blah, 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 blah. And I said, what, how do we wrap this all into one? And being a person from the MTV generation, you know, and even looking at the call signs for all the stations, ABC, CBS, you know, NBC, Fox, you know, we were sitting there going, okay, we need to simplify this and kind of wrap it under umbrella eyes that. And what do we do at the heart of what we do? And I said to the producer, I go, well, we feature independent artists and businesses and we distribute on TV. Independent artists, businesses, TV. Independent. We're an independent studio. Independent, independent. Kept kept ringing coming up. And I said, ITV. Independent mm -hmm. television. And I didn't know that ITV over in London, in, 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 in Great Britain existed. I know I always say England, I guess. I'm, I'm old school like that. And <laughs> England existed. And it was just like, here's the BBC and then here's ITV. I didn't know that existed. Let alone, I didn't know that Apple was going to launch the ITV, which later yeah. became the Apple TV. So um, we decided. So what happened is in that point, um, Phantasmagoria became ITV short films. Image Nightlife became ITV Nightlife, Extreme Sports, Northwest Extreme Sports became ITV Sports. And we launched, we had about another six other genres of shows, art, fashion, restaurant, uh, video games, comedy, live music, all under the ITV umbrella. Now we had one website, one logo, and we just had these separate shows. But each of the separate shows were going to become its own separate weekly show. So you could have, you know, short films on Wednesdays, sports on Thursdays. Um, nightlife on Fridays, you know, and such and so forth. Like, so we had eight separate series underneath the ITV umbrella, and we mm -hmm. pitched it to the networks, and they liked it. Now, at the time, we were looking at, and I know we're getting to the downloads part and how this all blew up, and our it blew up like in a big way. Um, at the time, there was no online distribution, and we were looking at what we did see with this company, which everyone knows now what it's all about, called YouTube, that came out. And when we looked at YouTube, we were like, yeah, that's a bunch of people just kind of talking to their cameras. And it was you, too, but it was your way of getting you, but it was not broadcast worthy. You didn't see any broadcast television shows. You didn't see any, um, you know, 
there wasn't that much well-produced content going up to YouTube because people were still in a broadcast mindset or a cable mindset. If, if yeah, it was new. You know, it was, it was, it was too brand new. Yeah. So we kind of passed on the YouTube thing, looking back in hindsight, like, eh. but I was working for Apple at the time. And when I was working for Apple, they had come out with the photo iPod with a color screen because before it was just a gray screen. And I said to myself while working in the store one day, I was like, you know what? What would it take to get a watered down version of QuickTime software, run it on an iPod, and you can start playing videos on these iPods? And I was like, that's going to that's gonna be kind of the new thing, I think. I, I, and this is before, I mean, Apple had their secrets. They always had their secrets, the new greatest, latest toys. But I was sitting there, and lo and behold, three months later, the video iPod got released. I remember when that thing got released. That was insane. That was, the, I, everyone, I, I was young. I was a child. I had to have been like maybe 13, maybe, maybe a little bit younger. I was a little baby. I think it was late 2005, 2005, 2006-ish. Gosh, I should look that up. I, I, was, I should know these dates, but yeah. I was young. I was. Super- I think it was late 2005 because I just, I was working for the store for a little bit. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, but I, I, that was the, that was the shit. That was awesome. And then, I mean, it was, and then it was shortly after that, two years later, they came out with the iPhone, which. Yeah, in 2007, exactly. So, so that's the great thing is, is, so what happened is we're at the store and all of a sudden, boom, they dropped this iPod video on us. And I'm like, okay, how do I get my shows on that device? Now, the funniest thing was about this whole story is that I, I was, we figured out how to get a podcast up and running. So it's like, okay, cool. You got to have a podcast. You can submit it to Apple. We had our podcast there. And um, I called, made some calls within Apple. But the funny thing was, is all the iPods that got distributed to all the stores, they didn't have any videos on them because mm. they couldn't talk about, they couldn't announce the deals they made with the networks because it would have announced the fact that an iPod video was coming out. So you have all these people coming into the store saying, can I see it? Can I see it? Can I see it? And you're like, here it is. And like, it looks just like a regular iPod and there's no videos on it. There was, they gave us no demo. They gave us no assets to load. So I went to the store, our store of Bellevue Square. And I loaded on all the iPods. I loaded our television series on all the iPods. So they, all our pilot episodes, all eight episodes were on every iPod in the store. And so when we were showing people, demoing it, they're like, wow, that's cool. That's a show. And they go, what show is that? And we're like, it's this local Seattle-based television show called ITV. And they're like, oh, cool. I mean, we didn't get much from that. But it, the managers of the store, the managers were kind of like, We'll let it slide there <laughs> because there isn't anything and you're helping increase sales. But that wasn't corporate approved to do it. Yeah. And they're pretty, they're pretty strict about that sort of stuff. But, but that's a, vi- that's a genius marketing tactic on your part. I mean, that's awesome. It was crazy. So what happened is I made some contacts through Apple, contacted the right people. And I said, hey, we got this series. We're ready to go. You know, here's our background. And the guy said, okay, Darren, Here's what we're going to do for you. Just wait till next Thursday. And I went, okay, this is the iTunes dev team, product placement team, all that stuff. And I say, okay, what's happened on Thursday? He goes, I can't tell you. Just go look in iTunes on Thursday. I went, okay, cool. So Thursday comes around and iTunes at the time, when you went to go look for a podcast, you searched for podcast and it was just a database, like a, sh- like a boom. And it just listed them in alphabetical order. What they'd done is they'd gone back and revamped the entire iTunes store and made the, the different categories. So you had, and 90% of them were all audio podcasts. So you had comedy and this and that and this, sports, fashion, all, but they made a video podcast section. And in that video podcast section, we debuted at number 48 out of 50. Mm-hmm. So here goes our immediate, our rise from, you know, 1,000 downloads a week to 10,000 downloads a week to 50,000 to 100,000, to at one point we're doing 300,000 downloads a week, moved up to position 28. And this is, remember, this is iTunes in the world. Like everyone is buying the new video iPod. They're going and saying, what can I download? What's the hottest one to download? And and people are checking our shows. And we only had our eight pilot episodes up there. So we're just like, sorry, I don't, don't, no, go ahead, go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt, but this is really, this is really interesting content. Like I never thought, yeah, you know, when people are buying the video iPod, you, there's not TV shows and movies to download. Like there, yeah, like like a year or so later, it was TV shows where you could download, you know, episodes of wh- whatever you were watching at the time. But there was nothing there, so yeah, it makes sense that they would go, well, hey, we need something. Let's you know convert 
podcast to video or like support video podcasts and then those are blown up that's I, I never really thought about that but that makes a lot of sense sorry go on no so that's what really the crazy thing was though is that we started to realize this and we're like okay we're seeing such a success here let's look at our distribution model and say is broadcast television really the way we were going to go and i had just right. launched on nbc with itv at that time um uh, you know locally to put the shows there and and do you have a contract so, in place uh well there's a few ways you can get on the stations and on the air and it wasn't necessarily a contract we we self-produced our own shows gotcha. so we bought the airtime it was a, it was all it was all internally produced so gotcha. we bought the airtime they they most of the local stations wouldn't unless you get a good track record going they wouldn't pick it up and we would self syndicate to them anyways and we would just basically make the shows and deliver tapes to the stations and they'd cut us a check and then they'd sell the advertising in it but very rarely do they ever do that because then there's you would we're going to get into copyright later on in this episode <laughs> yeah, yeah. and that's just yeah. one one little inkling of a caveat of what you got to get into to get to the real world of all of this stuff mm -hmm. that people just have no clue whatsoever mm -hmm. but we'll talk about that in a little bit but yeah so we self-produced and put everything on but we assessed everything and said you know what we don't need the youtube model because we're doing downloads over here on podcasting we're featured in itunes how you can't make it further that we were even listed as a new and noteworthy podcast mm -hmm. twice and in, in, in there so i mean you're getting all this publicity but we're sitting back going how do we monetize this how do we make any money with this you know because nobody knew and we reached out to the other top 50 podcasters and there was a couple like <clears throat> i don't know if you remember the show ask a ninja mm -hmm. ask a ninja no okay our viewers at home can't see that but i'm gonna ask <laughs> you, i'm gonna ask you for a video transcription of this so i can actually post the video of it so it's gonna yeah, be some fun stuff um but um long story short yeah ask a ninja he ended up getting sponsored by verizon you know but there was no way to track your real downloads in the television world you have nielsen ratings in radio you have arbitron in podcasting, we had downloads. We had mm -hmm. no blog. We had no Facebook. There was no social media. I mean, MySpace was there, but there was no way to tie in what your viewership was, what your target audience was, who was watching, how long they watched for, anything. So you could almost make up anything you wanted and say, yep, this is what we got. Back going back to the early days of the dot com era and saying, oh, we get a million hits on our website every day. Yeah, because they put a bunch of little pixel icons that are blank on the bottom of their site. They put Five million of those up. So when somebody hits the page, there's five million hits to our page mm -hmm. every day. No, you, you, people were fluffing numbers, so nobody knew how to monetize a podcast. Still, it's even still tough to do that to this day. Right. Yeah. And that's 15 years later, looking mm -hmm. at this. So um, success there. We ran off the back back end of, of running the podcast and delivering everything online and doing stuff and set the way forward. Clock 2009. I started, I went to Winter Music Conference and was there. While I was there, I was doing some interviews with some A-list celebrities. We'll get into that in a few moments because we'll set the white clock forward about a year later. And this DJ comes to me and he says, hey, we're sitting in the, in the room. He was with us in the hotel room. He goes, hey, have you ever heard of this thing called Ustream? And I go, no, I haven't. And at the time, I was running internet radio stations from my house. I had already looked into what it would take to get a server from like Akamai or, or, or you know some other big, big company and pay for service space to do a live streaming show. And I was like, guy, it was going to cost me like five, $6,000 a month. That blah, blah, blah. It was just like way out. Of, I was like, whoa, this is way too much when I'm hosting. By the way, <laughs> I was hosting our podcast series on a GoDaddy server on a $15 a month account for probably, oh, I got flagged by them four times over the course of 15 years. The last time I had to finally move away. They're like, you can't do this anymore because it, it, just, just up until 2018, we were probably doing anywhere from 90 to 120 terabytes of data a month yeah. on a $15 a month account. <laughs> so much bandwidth. <laughs> and they're like, you can't do that. I go, but you give me unlimited bandwidth. You give me unlimited storage. It says it. Well, that's not how this works. And they Contract were is over. <laughs> yeah, basically it's, it's over. You, you're, you can't do that. So that's way forward clock stuff. But anyways, um, so uh, I start looking into this live streaming thing because I'm like, there's no company in the world's going to give this away for free. There has to be a catch. And plus, I'm a Mac guy. This isn't going to work. This is probably Windows stuff. So, uh, I mean, I could have gone through virtualization, and I ended up actually ended up working for a virtualization company after Apple. And but we won't talk about that. But long story short, um, you know, I was like, let me check out this live streaming stuff for 
So for the summer of 2009 or that year, I was exploring the idea of live streaming and I started, I did my first ever full live stream show, which became ITV Live. But we took all kind of all the genres of ITV, which was our broadcast series, and then tried to do them all in a live streaming performance. Like at the, we went to the Central Cinema in Seattle. We had stage so we could show short films. We had a live studio audience. We had a comedian as our host. We had audience participation segments. Uh, we had a DJ that was playing on the stage. It was kind of going to yeah. be like a smorgasbord of everything but streamed live on site, on location. And we used this piece of technology. It was really awesome, which came back into my life later called the TriCaster, kind of set it up. We had bad internet problems. It kind of went, as first go rounds do when you don't know what you're doing and you're testing internet on site. Now I, I know my, 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 I know my uh, check sheet, let's just say that. Right. What to check right. off and make sure you have. And, but out of that experience, I said, what was the easiest thing to produce? Well, it was the DJ segment. Because mm -hmm. all I did is I had to turn the cameras on, point them at the DJ, and say, wow, I didn't have to really do anything for about 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. And the crowd, and the, and the audience was rocking to the DJ. The online viewers are like rocking. And I said, okay, I'm on to something here. The DJ playing. Hmm. DJs. Right. Okay. So then I went to my nightclub promoter friends and DJs that I knew. Because I was, I've been nightclubbing in Seattle for, I mean, over half my life, more than half my life, um, actually. And so I was bouncing this idea around saying, hey, we should stream DJs live, stream DJs live. And I had this idea called the DJ Sessions. And one night, my friend Alex, and by the way, you can go back and see all these old episodes of my first live streams. <laughs> They're ingested in our website at thedjsessions.com. If you go back, you can watch the first ever episode of the DJ Sessions with me literally dialing for dollars, my little shirt and tie, a hat on, and I'm dialing for dollars, or me singing karaoke doing the whole YouTube thing only on live streaming. Uh, and then you'll see the first ever episodes of the DJ sessions with me and Alex Eagleton. And he called me up on a Tuesday one time and just said, Darren, I'm coming over and we're doing the DJ sessions. And I went, oh, okay. Wasn't expecting it. Came over, we set up one camera kind of pointed at me and then one like, and over my shoulder, he was over my right shoulder and he was on his laptop DJ and I put a camera pointed down at him. We sat in those chairs and the, we were just sitting back drinking some wine and we had the music in our headsets and I'm Facebooking away. I'm chatting in the chat room. And that first hour, I didn't realize what was really happening until I got up to go to the bathroom and I had to take my headsets off and I took my headsets off and my entire apartment was completely dead silent. And I was like, wait a second. I just felt, I was just in a nightclub world chatting and interacting with people. I got these headsets on. And I, I, I put them back on going, what am I missing? And the connection was formed right there mm -hmm. going, okay, you can have a dance party. You can have an interactive experience. And I wanted an interactive experience going all the way back to 2002 when I did my first show on Fox. I wanted people to be able to watch our show when it was live on broadcast television, but be able to jump in a chat room with us and chat with the producers and actors while we were live on TV. Well, set the way clock forward seven years and here we are in a live chat room experience with a DJ playing, we're in the chat room and things are, and I can disseminate it via social media saying, click on the link, click on the link, boom, boom. I put those, I felt like I was in a nightclub. I mean, it was just, I was there in the music mm -hmm. with the DJ playing live right behind me. And I went to the bathroom, I came back, poured another glass of wine and we did another hour set. We called it the Beano session. The next week we took the, my, all my camera gear, my live switching camera gear, and I moved it to my bedroom and we called it the new DJ session. No, the new ITV live studios. At one point, my, my ex, who's my best friend now, she comes in the chat room at one point. And she's like, that's not a new studio. That's your bedroom. I can tell <laughs> by the paint on the wall. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Jenny, for killing my vibe right now. But, <laughs> yeah, whatever. So we, And then what happened is we were doing that out of my bedroom, and I'd invite people over to my house. We'd have a little party going on, and it was all fun. This is wintertime. This is October-ish, 2009. And I had a rooftop of my building, too. So I was going to eventually move the shows up this rooftop deck that I had, which had a beautiful view of Seattle. But uh, what happened is in, um, I want to say it was November-ish, 2009. This is where the next catalyst kind of went boom mm -hmm. and took off. And, and at that time, I think Ustream had come in and made us a featured partner as well. But then we were looking at both Ustream and Livestream as our platforms. And I kind of just afterwards, because what I wanted, are you familiar with the software called Restream or the online yes. software called mm -hmm. Restream? Yeah. So what I wanted to do, 
years ago. This is set the way back clock. Another first invention by Darren Bruce. Blah, 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 blah. I didn't maybe invent it, but I wanted to be able to stream to Ustream, live stream. And at the time, it was just in TV. But mm -hmm. I would have to have three separate computers. I would have to have the bandwidth for each one of those computers at my house. I think the best we could get was two megabit uploads wherever we were at, um, which was nothing back then. You know, now I'm a gigabit Ethernet at home. Right. Yeah. And I got my, my backpack that gives me 50 megabit upload anywhere I am in the world, which is a pretty penny. We'll talk about that later. But anyways, um, so we're, in my, we're at my house. And like I said, I was at Winter Music Conference earlier that year. And um, Sarah Cooper, who was Sarah Cooper PR, who's Carl Cox's PR manager, uh, who I talk with frequently, uh, also was the PR person for Dave Dresden, or mm. is the PR person for Dave Dresden. And Dave Dresden was coming to Seattle. And I said, hey, Sarah. By the way, the reason I bring this up too is somebody doesn't think that I have Carl Cox's PR agent on speed dial, and I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and we're still working on getting Carl on the show. Um, he's a pretty that busy would guy, be, so doing oof. his thing. We're we're we're, we're working on it. We're working That'd be on a it. huge already, show. Yeah, we put the we put the uh, well, we could be an interview right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the book um, we're working on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyways, Sarah, Sarah, I got in touch with Sarah and said, hey, Sarah, Dave's coming to town could we get Dave to come over and do a, an interview on the show and, and do a guest set? And she's like, yeah, sure. Let me reach out to him. Dave agreed to it, came over to my place and Dave Dresden played a bedroom set played in my bedroom on my show. That's I did a little sick. interview with him. And right there I said, wait a second. Okay. I was thinking about doing the show just for local DJs and giving local DJs exposure. Cause there was a show back in the day called groove tech that was out of Seattle. It was a record store up on Capitol Hill. And they would bring in DJs and the DJs could go back and spin live and be on their internet radio station. And eventually at one point, I think they did get a webcam and they had a little bit of video, but mm -hmm. that died in 2001. When the dot com mm -hmm. went out, they lost all their money. They went bye bye. Right. So set the way forward clock to 2009. Nothing had ever really been done like this for almost eight, nine years. And I have Dave Dresden on the show and I said, okay, round two, fight. I know what's up. I, I want to start putting A-list celebrities. So I started reaching out as a press meet, press meet him to all the A-list celebrities coming to town. A few months later, I got a studio down in Pioneer Square and um, kind of had the studio down there and, you know, had Sander Van Dorn, Matt Derry, you know, all these top DJs coming through. And people were like, this is the bee's knees. I had my own resident crew that was, you know, on board and we produced shows weekly out of this. I opened up the studio and not only were we doing the shows on Wednesdays, but I opened up an open table Thursdays. I opened it up for other people to rent studio time for me and do talk show Tuesdays. And um, I would produce their shows for them for literally 50 bucks an hour. And they would come in and do their show, but I would handle all the camera switching, the logistics. Right. And I would also form them, make them their own podcast and, and give them the file so they could upload and have their own podcast series as well. So <laughs> let's go from, you know, the, the 2009 to set the way forward clock all the way to 2017. Well, it's actually, we were doing, let me, before I do that, we were doing our show with A-list celebrity DJs two years before the Boiler Room even got started. Mm -hmm. And they got started over in, in, in London, out of the UK. Right. And, you know, they didn't have some of the hangups that we have, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, copyright law and such and so forth. And they had friends at the major festivals they were doing stuff with and, and, and got in there and became the Boiler Room, which is what I wanted to do. But the Boiler Room is focusing on A-list celebrity DJs. Our primary goal was to focus on the local DJs or the right. DJs that you didn't know about and give them video, give them exposure, online exposure, online combat with coupling it with the A-list celebrity DJs as yeah. well that were coming to town. So set the way forward clock to um, 2017. And the DJ sessions have kind of been going up and down, up and down, off and on. You know, I, I, I wasn't focused. And that can be a very hard thing to... When you're trying to do this, the one thing I can give to people is just stay focused, stay consistent, and don't because you don't want to burn yourself out. Yeah, I had done that a few times over the years where I just didn't even spread pick yourself up the too thin. Oh, that too, or you know, you got to make sure that the people around you and surround yourself with are supporting you, and they're not energy drained. Mm -hmm. and, and and you got to understand that if you are putting yourself into an energy drained situation, it's your fault for being there. It's nobody yeah. else's. Yeah, you know, and 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 so I mean, I've been I take responsibility for the situation that I put myself into in life of having myself go up and down over the years. But in 17, I was at the Eclipse Music Festival with some friends. I was actually out there by myself, kind of walking through the, 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 the area. And I just said, enough is enough. 
I am making a decision to take care of these five things in my life. And it was take care of number one, take care of number two. And number three was the DJ sessions gets a fully revamped, brand new, updated website. And we're going full forward, full board attack in 18. Boom, 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 boom. Right at that point, which is ironic, uh, we started getting the website. I had all that getting built. And the website was supposed to be done in six months, by the way. And, uh, and uh, I come into 2018, <laughs> January 18th. And all of a sudden, I get hit with this message from Ustream. So we were going to use Ustream as our platform and, and GoDaddy as our, our, our podcast server. Get a message from Ustream. Oh, IBM has bought us out. And your $10 special account that you have with us is going away. And your new bill will be $1,500 a month to host your live streams with us. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah. And with the way you're calculating how much data you're throwing at us, probably going to increase by $100 to $300 a month. And just keep going down the line. I'm like, what? So they go, yeah, you better pull all your videos off our site if you want to keep them. I'm like, Jesus. what? Yeah. So then I'm like, okay, now I got to figure out a new streaming solution and provider. because We were directing everyone to our YouStream feed. At the same time, this is when GoDaddy came back and slapped us on the hand for the fourth time and said, too much bandwidth, not good. You got to upgrade here. We're, we're, and if you don't clear all your, like it was like, 470 gigabytes of information off our Ooh. servers within a week within a week we're going to delete everything off your server oh I went, what i go dude i got to do a download of it i got to go in and pull it all okay so i lost GoDaddy and 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 Ustream. like boom, boom so i find out a solution for our back-end server solution which is fine we got that taken care of but i'm like okay who am i going to go stream with now and I'm, i say does anyone know anyone over at twitch and I, lo and behold, got put in front of the right person over Twitch. This is one of my things. I, I will tell everyone 98% of the information. Now it's probably 97% of the information out, but I will never give away my Rolodex and my contact. My Twitch contacts are closely guarded, coveted <laughs> information. But I got in front of the right person there, and I told him about our brand, told him what we were looking to do. And he said, you are a featured partner with Twitch. We're bringing you right on board. And when you look at the qualifications of what it takes to make a featured partner, you either got to have it or you got to climb these hurdles. Yeah, it takes a while. It is. And, and right now it's, it's a grind. When you, when you start from scratch, I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're talking like a three year grind. Yes. And, and people think that, oh, I can get 75 followers and I can have this and I can do this within a month. And that's like the little caveat for you to apply for partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you look at the real caveat of what they'll look at, like you said, probably a three-year grind and you better be making those numbers. Yeah. And I, I don't know if they're going to ease up or not with the advent of everyone jumping online in the last seven months, eight months, because it has been just boom. Like, I mean, I will cover that in just a little it's bit too. Crazy. Um, yeah, crazy. I mean, it, 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 people can't see this when listening, but when we share the video, they'll understand. Normally there's a progression curve. This happened with, it's happened with podcasting. It happened with YouTube. It happened with live streaming and it just kind of curves like slowly and people rise and the mistakes are learned information is shared people understand how to rise and get the cream of the crop this year it literally went completely poop 90 degree angle straight up and plateaued and if you wherever you're at in that scale is where you're stuck right now mm -hmm. unless if you're at the top okay you're gonna probably be at the top because you got places things and mechanisms to keep your stuff going but if you're at the bottom with just entry level getting in everybody's vying for attention and everybody's trying to figure it out and everybody in the masses and like i said normally there's a curve and a critical mass that people that get it go oh we're not going to look like that anymore and there's people that drop off everyone's kind of doing the same thing so they'll see this and duplicate it well then exponentially it grows and they're all duplicating the same thing which is it's not stimulating or fostering necessarily growth because those that grow are being so overshadowed by the content right. that's being delivered, by the ones that are doing it the wrong way, the ones that are doing it the right way, how are they ever going to make it out of that bubble, uh, of, of, of bursting that bubble and getting through that? We'll talk about that in a bit. Anyways, you know, we got featured on Twitch, and I didn't. when we debuted on the front page of Twitch, we were actually told at that time we were their first ever regularly scheduled live streaming DJ show. And I was like, whoa, cool. This was so 20... 2018. 2018. 2018. So they come in and they put us to the front page of the Twitch website. And I was not expecting to get what happened that day. I was, we had over 2,500 concurrent viewers. Oof. We were up there for two hours. We had 55,000 views. 
Huge. Uh, of like people watch. I was just like, okay, I'm home. Yeah. I am home. Ready to go. But I wasn't ready to launch yet because our yeah. website wasn't there. Our branding wasn't there. Everything that I needed to get there to get uh, sponsors and everything in place. So what I thought was going to be about six months to build this website and get it up and running. Well, remember, my website was based on GoDaddy and Ustream. Yeah. I had to go back and have my dev team rewrite the whole thing to basically ingest our podcast series into the site. So when I make a podcast, it brings it right over seamlessly mm -hmm. into the site. And I don't have to be uploading and do uploading and doing all this crap. And then the site had to look great and the bugs worked out and the kinks worked out looking good on mobile. And blah, 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 blah. Right. So it took about a year and nine months Ugh. for us to get the site out of beta. And it's a fully like customized site, right? It, it yeah. pretty much is. I've had it tweaked for us specifically to do yep. certain things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can go get the template. I won't tell you where to get the template <laughs> from, but I'll tell you what. It, yeah, it, it's had a lot of work done in the back. I've been, it still is. There's still things being done to it right now. And I'm I'm actually building a, a new mobile app that was that was kind of like I said, in 17, I kind of laid out the template to say, this happens first, this happens next, this happens next, this happens next, this happens. And right now where we're at, the site is out of beta. I would call it an alpha or I mean, version 1.0, 1.1. But the app is in now in development as well. I'm glad to hear that you're going the app route. And it's funny. So for the listeners, if you guys listened to last week's episode where we had Wyatt on from Donation, um, towards the end of the episode, we were talking about um, the whole ep I mean, the primary episode was ba basically ended up being about marketing your music as musicians um, and, you know, g getting g collecting leads and you know, good lead magnets. And he went into the idea of, you know, what's when you have a podcast or even when you're live streaming, you know, when you have your followers and your listeners, those are good. You know, th that's a good resource to have, but it's not the best type of lead that you can get. You know, you want to own those leads. You want to own emails. You want to own phone numbers. And he we were talking about this and he brought up the idea of an app because with an app, there's no greater way of getting in front of your contacts or your leads than an app and being able to send them a push notification directly to their phone and they see that and they're either going to swipe at it to get it away or they're going to click on it and now they're viewing your content, they're on your platform and you know whether or not you have ads running on there and you're generating ad revenue for people being on there or just they're buying your products, whatever it is. And so that really I that put things into perspective for me that I was like, huh, I never really thought about how valuable an app would be. So it's awesome to hear. It makes sense, especially for what you guys are doing. Of course, you'd have an app. Why wouldn't? you? Absolutely. One hundred percent. As a matter of fact, I just got a message from my my dev team on the app right now because we're, we're we're on a little hang up point, just a mm -hmm. little technical point that is like, come on, guys, just try to line a code for me and just make this <laughs> yeah. happen. Um, you know, this is the, this is the painstaking stuff that you go through that most people don't, you just don't wake up and say, Oh, I want a brand new website. Yes. It's going to work from day one or, Oh, I want a new app and it's going to work from day one. Yeah. This is the stuff where a lot of people think I vague book on Facebook and there's shit that I don't, sorry. I hope I can. No, right. Oh yeah. I cuss all the time. Don't worry. There's shit that I cannot tell people about because one, I have competitors. Yeah. And if I tell you, Oh, Hey, guess what? I just, I'm working on a deal with this company. Hey, guess what? I'm thinking about developing an app. Hey, guess what? I'm doing the, Hey, guess what? I'm capturing. Hey, I'm giving away all my secrets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying, I put out on Facebook. You're giving day, away the roadmap. I'm giving away the roadmap. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. not in this day and age, especially mm -hmm. when I know my, I would say my competitors, my frenemies, <laughs> my ardent fans that love me so much, mm -hmm. my haters. You know, they'd love to know what I'm up to, what's going on in the camp. They'd love to be a fly on the wall over here. And, and, and again, know some of the things that I know uh, we'll be talking about a little bit later, but uh, going back to, um, long story short, we were able to finally launch, like we had, we had got the site launched in 2019 and, um, debuted at PAX. We got our mobile studio truck that we drive around every year, uh, that drives in front of PAX, which every PAX person there has a Twitch account, 60,000 people plus a day, plus all the tourists and everything in the city seeing this truck driver around with a loud stereo system in it with which we'll talk about in a little bit too but um you know watching people dance in the streets and cosplay jump in the back rocking the streets and, and going through 
and, and just, you know, trying to build that up because all of them have Twitch accounts and, oh, wow, we're a feature partner on Twitch. So it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were getting ready to have a really amazing 2020. And it has been an amazing 2020 for us, by the way, uh, on the back end and, and, and making things happen in development. But we had contracts with the city to put our silent discos on. We were getting into the event space. Um, we had been doing events over the year, rooftop parties and some silent disco stuff. But really, 2020 was going to have a whole count. All 100 of our events had endorsements from multiple companies to go out and get sponsors and corporate sponsors and events with the city. And we were just ready to go. And then, boom, March hit. And it was like, boom, boom. Okay, down. all those. Bye-bye. <laughs> And um, we came back and we found out that we were actually lit. We were actually an essential business based upon what the governor's guidelines are for essential businesses, which was awesome. So we planned a, a, re, a relaunch in, in May of 2020, late May, and uh, got out there and had press come out and things were looking good. And things were tracking. And now all of a sudden the protests started happening. Yeah. And we were like, I was like, okay, not the right time to be promoting self-indulged projects i want to go back and i want to be part of the movement i want to get involved with that so after a few months of going back and forth and doing stuff there i said okay let's go back and look at the, the numbers that we're tracking and hey we should be in phase three and you can do 50 people in groups outdoors and did that so i chose the middle of july as our next launch date because remember three activations three launch uh, march may and then coming into july and so july comes around i got the date set well, late June, our governor comes in and says, you know what? We're not moving into phase three. We're going to a modified phase two. And I went, okay, well, what does that mean? It still allowed us to go remain and do what we did. So we went out to one of our local uh, parks, beaches called Golden Gardens, which is kind of a destination location, beautiful location, set up shop for the summer, just doing our, what we call safe silent discos, which now have become silent concerts. We can talk about that in a little bit too. But um, just basically giving people an outlet or a medium where they can share a collective music experience together in a safe, physical and social distance kind of way. Because our headsets go a thousand feet. So and you can be in a park with a group of up to five people as long as you stay six feet away from the next group of five and such, such and such and so forth. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, and we're out there actually live streaming our series on location, which is not an easy feat in itself. Um, you know, with the advent of 5G, you might see this happening a little bit more. Yeah. But you know, what are the cap problem is is you might get 5G when it's data download, but you still might be on a 3G connection when you're hotspot. Mm -hmm. You know, are you gonna get 5G hotspot or are you gonna get 4G hotspot? You get 3G. How much is that gonna be? How much are they gonna give you for that hotspot? They're probably gonna throttle that oh yeah stuff right now, just like they do with like you get 4G LTE all you want, but you only get so many gigabytes of 4G LTE data. Then it goes unlimited. And I think some of them drop down to 2.5. Mm -hmm. Some drop down to three. Some might even drop down to 2.5. And then they say, but the network's congested. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So anyways, we circumvented that problem by getting a new toy that lets us stream in demilitarized zones from around the world if we want to in the middle of a desert. Um, we'd have internet. You wouldn't have water, but we'd have internet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the kind of what we got. Yeah. So that being said, you know, we were out there at Golden Gardens doing our thing and just trying to keep the show, the brand alive in this time and then booking interviews with people such as yourself, booking interviews uh, with A-list celebrity you know, DJs from around the world, having them come in and, and launching our shows, the virtual sessions. But one of the things that we've really been focused on and we'll be focusing on for the next few weeks here is our mobile sessions. As we come into New Year's, uh, you know, we just got a sponsor on board. I kind of announced it on your show. Uh, Mackie, if you're familiar with that brand, mm -hmm. has just come on board and, and Following up, we're going to go into a new sponsorship agreement with them in 2021. But for 2020, they've come in and they've kind of donated some gear to us, which uh, if you're in Seattle and you know the DJ Sessions truck, just to let you know, you heard that truck and you thought it was loud now. <laughs> wait till you hear it gear probably up. next week. Oh, yeah. Uh, it has a 1600 watt sound system in it now, 215s with 600 watt woofers in it and a full outside, uh, full range system on the outside. But we're adding two more 15s and a full range sound system of about 4,000 watts to the truck. That's fucking crazy. That thing is going to be bumping. It's going to be the new party truck in Seattle. Well, that's the thing is, is yeah, we, that's what we do. It is a party bus. And we used to put people in the back. And for 20 bucks, they could roll around with us for four hours, BYOB, while our DJs play. We live stream the show, driving through the streets of Seattle and getting people dancing in the street going crazy. 
it was the first of its kind that we launched. Yeah, well, Actually, we got it 10 years ago. I mean, speaking of which, it's a good transition being the first of its kind because I don't see, I mean, I can't think of another, um, I, I can't think of another company or another live sh a DJ that is doing that sort of thing. This, you know, a mobile DJ truck, which is so unique and live streaming that experience. So it's almost it's a full experience that you get to watch as a viewer. And it seems like you guys have been able to be at the forefront of stick like sticking out compared to the rest, which is that's what it's all about. If you want a successful brand, you have to differentiate yourself from other people why should they be watching you or listening to you because you're this unique so i mean go how, how do you guys how do you come up with these ideas of and by the way if, if if the people listening if you guys have never seen one of these shows go check them out because the production value is ridiculous one i can point to is um alex uh who's Loesch, who was on this podcast back in a little over a year ago, I think maybe about exactly a year ago, he was on episode six, I think it was, where we were talking about record labels. He was just on the DJ sessions in October, right? I think it was October. Yeah, for like a Halloween show. And the production value of that show was unreal. It's so like you guys are doing legit stuff. So how can let's so let's kind of dumb it down for some of the smaller producers and DJs who you know, they don't have a massive production value. They might just have their bedroom. Um, what can they do to differentiate yourself, uh, differentiate themselves, especially with, you know, like you said, everyone is live streaming now and you're either at the top or you're at the bottom. There's not a lot of in between. So how do you close that distance to get up towards the top there? Two, two things, uh, not in any particular order. I'll start with the first because it's a little bit shorter of a statement. But the second is going to be what, what I think your, your viewers are going to want to hear. First statement is content is king. Yes. Doing a one hour show or a two hour show once a week is not going to rise you to the rank. It just, you've got to be out there. You've got to be committed. I can give you some back end. I can't give you the exact numbers, but I'll tell you this. In order to make a living at Twitch, I was in a meeting not too long ago, <clears throat> an online uh, video call with the director, of, uh, the vice president of marketing for Twitch and the director of content acquisition and development for Twitch. And they broke it down with a little graph. And they said, you want to make a living at Twitch, a, a decent living at Twitch. They broke it down. They said, here's three tiers, zero to 4,000, 4,000 to 10,000, 10,000 above. If you're in the 4,000 to 10,000 person range, when you go live, when you go live, every time you go live and you're going live for a minimum of four hours, three times a week, you can make a living at Twitch. And that's a decent, like what they would consider a living, say fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. You can be full time. You're living comfortably. You're living pretty comfortably. Yeah, living comfortably. But if you're if you're if you're looking at your streams and you're thinking you're gonna make money and it's gonna blow up and you're big and you're at a hundred, breaking that threshold against what's in the plateau right now, if you didn't have your branding, you didn't have your marketing, you didn't have your socials, you weren't capturing your emails, mm -hmm. you don't have an app built where you can capture those phone numbers and push a button. All the people that came from a physical world, and that's what they were in, a physical world with a nightclub. Remember, why were those people really going to a nightclub or a big event to be part of that physical location, to be part of that physical event and see it in place? And if they weren't capturing emails at the door, okay, they didn't have a street team or somebody saying, let me get this, or they weren't selling their tickets online. They did a cash only at the door. If they were selling everything to Eventbrite, they'd be capturing an email address yes. for every address that comes through, which would let them have an email list, which would then let them turn that into a newsletter. Mm -hmm. Our newsletter is 9,000 strong, clean 9,000 strong. That's a good email list. You know, you go, and I get 9,000 emails directly to people that have subscribed. Mm -hmm. Our app, when it gets launched, will go out there. And obviously, we'll, we'll ask for that phone number so we can do a push notification. When we go live, if I tell you what's happening for 2021 and the amount of content we're going to be churning out, what's even on the dev table right now, you'd be like, fuck. <laughs> what? And yes, and, and so what you witnessed with that Loesch episode, which by the way, to your audience and to people watching this, you can go back to our website, the djsessions.com, go to the search bar at the top, type in L-W-O-S-H, it'll pull up that episode. Or even just type in Freak Stream. And it'll pull up all the freak stream episodes that we did on October 30th, just to kind of 
Mm -hmm. Shameless self plug. I'll, right? I'll put that in the uh, show notes too. I'll have links to that stuff. I believe on I, if you click on the A list section, all that should pop up to the A list section. And if you want to check there, if you click on the live button, it'll drop down and show you our, our archives. And mm -hmm. actually, archives will drop down and show you all the different variations of the shows we have. And you can search by DJs. And that was one of the cool things about our site is you can go back and search for episodes that go all the way back. Like one of our residents, sorry, I'm digressing here. No, you're good. Your question. Oh, one of our resident DJs, Sergey Andre Cool. One of his first times he ever came on the show was in like 2009, 2010-ish, early 2010. He was like 19 years old. Mm. And, you know, he came on the show, played at our studio back in Pioneer Square. You can type in Sergey Andre Cool. Or that back then it was, it was DJ Kulikov. Or, but it pulls up his episode <laughs> That's on, so his own, awesome. on its own resident page from 10, almost 10 years ago. That's awesome. You know, and you can see him play. And it's like, that's, that's one of the features I wanted was people to search our database. But right. anyways, content is king. First rule, <laughs> content is king. Now, when you say content is king, would you say the consistency of the content? Um, is it the quality of all of it? What? Correct. Yeah. So, so obviously, quality, consistency, um, competency, um, you know, the value. There also value, is, yes. There's so much that goes into a podcast. One of the biggest ones, how much are you interacting with your crowd? You know, mm -hmm. just putting up a camera and sitting there and going like this, mm -hmm. it ain't fun. I mean, interactive what, what what yes you got to be interactive you got creating experience that's what you got to do bill you got to get your viewers drugged into your show and, and because not only are these what would like i said what used to happen is you get the 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 before the big names would drop and do stuff there'd be a mass of people down here doing it doing it doing it and then somebody would pop off at the b level or c level and then b level and then a level would go we need to get on this well, what happened mm -hmm. is, again, it just went boop, boop, and everyone was at the top. So yeah. all the a levers were streaming. B there was no gap to bridge that. So there was no learning curve for people to kind of rise out of that and get to the top. Right. So now, let's say I want to do my live stream on Friday night, and I have my crew, and I have my friends, and I'm all good. Yeah, and I know I can get 100 viewers. But let's say I'm doing house music. Well, all of a sudden, Gabriel and Dresden goes on on a Friday night at the same time. Or Maceoplex goes on or whoever goes on and, and you're like you can't watch two streams at the same yeah. time mm -hmm. you can you can click on and, and be there in your friend's chat room okay and, and watch the show with it on mute but watch the a-list over here and listen to them for free <laughs> for free for free yeah. for free yeah and and then yeah how do you monetize this at least we can talk about it in a bit too but the thing is is yeah how do you how do you gain attention in that kind of world i recently had somebody come to me and here, I'll give a little caveat. They said, oh, it was a nightclub. They wanted to stream out of their nightclub here in Seattle. They said, we want to do this on Friday or Saturday night. I said, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. You want to do this on a Tuesday night. Okay? You do it on Tuesday night because then we're not up against Insomniac. We're not up against Live Nation. We're not up against Gabriel and Dresden, which these are shows that I place right behind, position number five on Twitch when, when the DJ session goes live. But I know we can go and be number one. If we go Tuesday, right, right, you know, and that I can take screenshots say to my sponsor. Okay, look, we make number one, we make number two. I mean, really, on Twitch, the goal if you're trying to be ranked, the place you want to be is when you click on like most viewers, like top top shows, you want to be in that top eight position. Yeah, because when the page loads, it's one two three four, one two three four. If you can be in that top eight, you're probably going to get people going, oh, that's hot, <laughs> oh, yep. that's hot, click, you know, and um, that's kind of where you want to be placing. That makes sense. So. Content is king. Differentiating your shows from other shows is king. So again, we started in my living room. We started in my bedroom. We, I used to do the green screen thing with my device in the bedroom using uh, electric sheep as the background. I used to bring in YouTube videos in the background. So I, if you watch the old shows, man, this is some crazy shit. I used to be, so the DJs, they didn't know how to have a video performance. And this mm -hmm. is where it comes to content is king and the, and the interaction of the shows. And the DJs, they, they didn't know video production. They weren't used to that. So they would just be doing the knob turning thing like this. Boring, boring, boring. But I would be right there on the side next to them doing my video production switching. You'd see me bouncing up and down dancing for mm -hmm. four hours straight. People would actually tune in to watch me going, is this guy on drugs? Yep. What did this guy take? What is he on? This you guy's gotta be entertaining. And, and I'm on the microphone and I'm interviewing him. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I mean, after the show was done, I'm like, I just a four hour fucking workout. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was, it was some awesome times and I would get pumped up because that would give the DJ that physical connection 
of what their music was doing to an audience. Because in an online world, you don't have that. Mm-hmm. Now people are finally getting hyped up on their numbers. They're getting hyped up on the chat room, but mm-hmm. they're trying to throw those numbers and throw that chat room on the screen. And personally, if any one of them knew how to really do a focus group and came back, they remove all that shit. Boiler room doesn't put all that shit on their episodes. We don't put all that shit on our right. episodes. You know, we are actually have some new marketing that I've done for the show, but it's very limited. It's about a minute and a half. You'll see it in our new branding for the show. It's actually pretty cool. And I, I got that idea from a conversation I had with Entity. I cannot name because I'm under a non-disclosure with them, <clears throat> Twitch. But, um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, you just want to make it a clean product because you got to understand what you think is cool. This is the other big one. What you think is cool, what your friends and family think is cool, it doesn't translate to somebody over in Germany who may yeah. be like, eh, yeah. or in Japan, eh, or Australia or Greece, or London, or New York, or, hey, the kid down the block. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that might be in your own backyard. You yep. know, it doesn't translate that way. So you got to get out of that mindset and say, what am I doing to appease that? And go take a look at the bigger shows and see what they're doing. You know, is Gabriel, are these other shows doing all that eye candy shit over? And I guarantee you they're not because they're working with producers that go, we know the focus groups. We know the data. We know that shit isn't good for your show. It's mm-hmm. it's garbly gook. It actually devalues the show, makes it look like I won't use the term, but makes it look unappealing to a, a wide, large, massive audience. And so, you know what? We're not going to do that. Yeah. And and go take go take points from them. Look 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 at your camera quality. Look at your light. I used to work for Apple. Sell people MacBook Pros all the time and Final Cut Pro. They come into the store because they bought a four thousand dollar camera. They say, what do I need to do to make my footage look better? And send me the computer and they'll help me do this. And I go, well, let's first ask the question before I sell you this $2,000 computer, this $5,000 MacBook, uh, this, this uh, I, uh, um, Mac Pro. Um, do you have a tripod? Do you have a lighting kit? Yeah. Do you have any Are you diffusing your lighting? <laughs> Are you diffusing your lighting? Have you even read a book on lighting? Yeah. I mean, before we get into all that, I could say you could spend $500 here and it'll increase your production value yeah. by tenfold. Mm-hmm. And they go, no, no, no. And I go, okay, let's stop. Cause I was the film and television guy working in the Apple store with broadcast credits, film credits and all that mm-hmm. shit working in the industry. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's, 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 let's hone this back in here. Cause you're, and then they get training lessons from me thinking I'm going to train them on how to use final cut pro and turn their shit into gold. And I'm like, that's not what the program does. You give me shit. And you can't turn shit into gold. It doesn't work yeah. like that. And they'd be like, whoa, and I'm like, oh, no, here, go, here, go get a tripod, <laughs> you yeah. know, stop holding, trying to hold your camera and do this. Yeah. So <laughs> those kind of things. So anyways, um, content king, making sure that, you know, you're doing something different. So it may be something like where I knew I had my, my apartment and yeah, we were in my living room and yeah, I had my bedroom, but I knew I had that rooftop. And when it got warm, we were going to be able to go back up to that mm-hmm. rooftop and shoot from that rooftop. But I, I ended up getting a studio. So I moved the party out of my house to my studio and that was fun times um, and kind of decked it out and all that fun stuff. But then I got the truck in 2010 and we yeah. actually debuted the truck. Speaking of freak stream, which is actually kind of homage to freak night, which normally happens here in Seattle. Yep. We actually debuted the truck at freak night, 2010. We actually nice. pulled it into the event center and That's had it there sick. and the way the room was set up there was two rooms and everyone had to walk around this big curtain we were kind of right there and we were supposed to be streaming live another internet blunder we were using a, a t-mobile connection and while i was there when nobody was there at the facilities it worked just fine but you put twenty five thousand people into a fucking room and your internet goes to shit so we weren't able to stream it live mm-hmm. record it i think i recorded those episodes i should have no you know what Oh, maybe I did. I recorded the tape back then. Wow. Anyways, yeah, I think I was recording the tape. But long story wow. short, um, yeah, we debuted the truck. And the truck back then, we could only park it and do our streams in the back of the truck. Set the way clock forward to 2009 where we can actually drive around and not only record the shows, but now we can record and stream the shows while driving around. And I like the mobile. I, I feel like people are starting to realize, I, I guess technology might be keep catching up now that you can do these mobile streams because there's one guy, I can't remember if he's in the UK or not. I don't remember, but God, I wish I could remember what his name was, 
he was I saw him on Facebook initially on a live stream he was doing and then I saw him in a couple of TikToks but he straight up uh uh he he straps in a full CDJ actually I don't know if it's CDJs it might just be a controller that's hanging yeah a controller that's hanging out and he's walking around just like he'll go hiking and he's live streaming and he's got a mic and he'll fi- he'll run into random people and he'll like start talking to them and it's so that right there is so unique and it's blowing up and people are like i love this shit so he takes it one step further not only does he do the walking around he'll go to grocery stores he'll be on a bicycle riding mm-hmm. around he'll be you know on his a, name? a kayak i i was gonna look him up uh i did i was i wanted to reply yeah, back yeah, yeah. yes this guy is doing it that th- he's on a he's on a kayak going down a river Mm-hmm. He's in the middle of the street with traffic going by both ways. I mean, that is just like some amazing stuff. And he's he's built this unit with the camera mounted up in front yep. of him with a strap on thing and a microphone that he can do his whole thing. And yeah, it's just it's a it's just a lightweight controller that he's just doing these sets for. And I believe the question is though, is he doing it live? Yeah. Or is he pre-recording it right. and uploading that? And there's a very I, I will take a hard line on that that anyone that pre-records and says it's live that's kind of a in my personal hey get away with what you want to get away with but don't fool your audience Mm -hmm. that can come back to bite you in the ass later on you know you really if you're going to be live be live if it's pre-recorded let them know it's pre-recorded but this is when i'm distributing it and it'll go live and i'll be in the chat room because i'll be live in the chat room don't wishy-washy the word live yeah and i'm not sure if he talks I, I guess the best way to see if he is actually live is if he's like talking to the chat or something like live, live messages. So let's say someone is interested in doing a mobile set like that. I think the first question that people are probably going to have is how are you able to get an internet connection out there? And I think you mentioned that you have some fancy new backpack that you can actually connect to a network or it produces. They can't see it on camera, but when I get the video information, this is this Ooh. is what we call the fabled backpack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, ooh, it's sexy. It's actually pretty awesome. Yeah. So it's a Teradek bond. It's um, about six thousand dollars, and I'll open this up and show you how sexy this is. Like the Ferrari of internet stuff. So you open this up, and inside, oh, oh, damn. oh what do we got here? Wait, okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. Ooh. There we go. So you have basically a, a what's called a bonded network thing here and then these here are individual sim cards so you can hook up six different sim cards to it and this aggregates all the bandwidth and then gives you um you know aggregated bandwidth so even if you're getting two bars on a cell phone say you're getting one meg from one sim card you have six of those sim cards you're gonna get six megs total and it bounces it it bounces it off the towers um so i can get t-mobile and at&t i can add verizon sticks in if i want to um, but it also puts you at the, it puts you on the, um, it doesn't put you on the consumer bandwidth either. It puts you on okay. the commercial bandwidth towers. Oh, so you wow. get prior, so you get priority access. Yeah. You're getting nice um, network connect. So What's this that is, called? This is, it's called a Teradek bond. Teradek. Um, yeah. T-E-R-E, T-E-R-A-D-E-K. And it's, it's now you got to remember this thing is not inexpensive to run it runs yeah. about it's about 15 dollars per gigabyte Ooh. put that in perspective if i do a four hour show at 720p 30 frames a second about 2.5 megabits per second i'm gonna look at probably anywhere from 90 to 120 dollars per four damn. hours damn so imagine now let's just multiply that by the amount of content the dj sessions produces we have eight events every month every saturday and sunday we do our silent discos we have our truck every Wednesday, four times a month. Right there, there's 12 episodes. We're launching another two series, basically. Let's just say right there, 12 shows a month. Now, at our silent discos, we can have multiple channels going. Mm-hmm. I can produce up to 16 hours of content at each of those silent disco events if I want to do. Okay. Keep it basic and just say it's four hours of content or 48 hours of content a month. Okay, if we're looking at, let's just say 50 to round it up just for shits and giggles. 50 hours of content um divided by 100 but you're looking at about maybe about five well no i'm sorry divided by four which we're down to 12 12 times 100 about 1200 to 1500 bucks a month to run it Mm -hmm. or just our base distribution 
Okay. So that's so, just distribution on site yeah. distribution, making sure we have guaranteed signal and not trying to do it off of freaking Right, right, right. And I'm sure there's you know, there there might be a couple of listeners that are interested in going the route of the DJ sessions, but there's probably a good majority of you who don't need any of this crazy you know, you don't need to be spending twelve hundred dollars a month on streaming, but this is a good, this is another great segue into going, okay, so you know what you need to, you know what your cost is for doing these live stream events, you know, consistently. Um, so now you have to come up with that money. So what, what does that look like monetizing that? Cause I, I know what monetization looks like and it's not easy. Um, and I can only imagine with like live, live streaming, basically free events uh what that could look like so what's been your journey from trying to monetize stuff and what kind of tips can you give to monetizing live streams the the toughest thing for anyone to prove is going to be demographics yeah and the yeah. only way they're going to be able to prove those demographics if they can use youtube did eventually make a back-end system because you log in through your google account you usually give them phrases facebook also has those demographics available as well I don't know. Let's why don't why don't you explain why demographics are important for you to monetize? Yeah, ab absolutely. I'll give you case in point. Going back to the conversation we have about ITV, when we launched ITV on the air in 2005 and put it out there, we got our Nielsen ratings. And I usually captured this data after about two seasons or almost 26 weeks of data. First season data, you're like, yeah. Second mm -hmm. season data, yeah. And we didn't see any of our data coming in until really about week four. Wow. So I knew week four to week 12, week 15, that's going to be starting to see our sweet spot. Funny enough, our show, ITV, was targeted to 18 to 25-year-olds, focusing on maybe 21 to 28-year-olds, really the bar going outside uh, disposable income, targeted household of we were looking to get the, the people that were making anywhere from 15 to 16 bucks an hour roommate situation. So you're going to put them into about a $60,000 per household equivalent, you know, with some mm -hmm. expendable, you can want to know where to go, what to do, what restaurants to go to, what nightclubs to go to short films, what sporting events are in depth, what art galleries, what fashion things are happening, mm -hmm. all that fun stuff. And that was obviously 10 years ago that, right. Is, that income is bracket has changed, yeah. but you need to know these target demographics. So when you go out to a sponsor, you aren't gonna say, "Hey, um, uh, 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 hey, uh, Coca Cola, hey, Pepsi," which those are bad examples to use because yeah. they go after such a younger demographic, yeah. anyways. But you go after somebody and say, "Hey, what's their target demographic?" You try to fit that target mm -hmm. demo with the brand that you're looking to sponsor your show, so you can match and align that 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 they can get the value out of it because you're hitting their target audience. So then people will say, "I want to go shop and go buy their product." Mm -hmm. Funny enough, with ITV, we found out. When we were taking, even though we were taking the number one spot at our time slot, which was 1.30 in the morning, <laughs> that's all that's available on network television at the yeah. time. Because uh, we were up with corporate contracts. So you, mm -hmm. You're not going to ever bump the Simpsons out of place. No. In no. Your look. It just, they were in lock-in oh, contracts, yeah. fraternity. So the best we could get was like 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning. And it was still decent because we were getting 15, 20,000 viewers at that time. But we found that our target demo was females. 35 to 50. I think it was 34 to 50 was our target. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, who do I go after? The girl I was dating at the time, I said, you know what? She worked for a dermatology clinic. Perfect, perfect Huge. audience space. Who's going right yeah. there? Boom. Let's go talk to dermatology places. Where are places that women are doing? And boom, they sign. Here you go. Sponsorship. You know, so that's key. And people are not doing their focus groups. They're not doing the, they can say their target demographics, but do they really know what their target demo is? Yeah. And, and granted, nowadays, you could pretty much say a target audience for our electronic music show, you know, is, is going to be somewhere in their 20 somethings to 30. -somethings, but mm -hmm. I'm 46 and I still listen to electric. Yeah. Oh, that's it's it's rapidly shifting. I mean, my dad is 55, 56. He loves electronic music, loves it. I mean, he's like super into like tech house and minimal stuff. And you can argue you could you could say, OK, if you're a if you're a tech house producer. I can probably guess your age and I can probably guess your demographic and I'm guessing my demo your demographic is my father and you're probably around the same age as him maybe 10 years younger ish you're probably anywhere from like 37 to 45 is probably your age as a tech house producer minimal house producer 
Um, so there's that shit. And, and it is like, you know, the, the people who were super into electronic music 15 years ago when they were 18, they're now in their mid thirties going into their forties. And the, you can even see the shift with genres. I, I guarantee their genre shift has changed. The people who are super into big room house, electro house stuff, future bass, you're probably between the ages of 16 and 24, 25. It's probably your age. Yeah. And that's very relative to know when you're targeting. And the problem is, is when you go to online distribution, now you're dealing with the world. Yeah. I was actually talking with the guy, do you know, um, Truncate, DJ Truncate? I've heard of him. I don't know him, but I've heard of him. I, I was doing an interview with him last week and he does a show called DJs and Beers. Oh yeah. And really kind of cool content. It's just him and his friends kicking back. It's nothing formal, but he tells me in the interview, Beatport actually approached him to do oh. his show. And uh, here's what happened. It was all going through. Beatport was going to fund them, find all this stuff. And they do their show every Thursday, 12 PM um, noon Pacific standard time. Cause he lives in LA and he said, that's a great time. Cause it's nine o'clock over in Europe for the other DJs from around the world that he knows. Right. And all. It's a good time to do it. Well, the deal got all the way up until ready to go almost. And before the last minute, said, yeah, can you do your show earlier in the day? And he says, no, because I'm not going to start drinking beers at 9 a.m. <laughs> you know, and that literally killed yeah. the deal because they wanted to shift the timing of his show. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's that kind of non-negotiable. You get into those kind of situations like. No, this is our show. We have to, we go live at nine because everyone that we want, because then they might have been trying to think, and they're thinking they probably have their data saying, yep. we know when the hottest times are, when this yep. can sell the most. If we're going to give you money, this is when it happens. Yeah. If I was him, I would have said, sure, we'll try it at 9 a.m. for six months, but you're going to pay me in advance on this. Yeah. Let's say if the deal was, say, Maybe the deal was a, I'm just going to make an arbitrary number out. Sorry, Truncate, if you hear this, I don't know what the deal is. I'm just <laughs> imagining a number for calculation purposes alone. If it was a $50,000 deal and they were going to give them $12,500 a quarter, you know, to do the show, instead of $12,500 per quarter, I would have said, okay, you're going to give me 70% for the first six months. And if it works, we'll continue on. You'll give me the yeah. rest of the 30% for the remainder and we'll keep it on at nine. If not, we cancel after six months. But I get 70% of that money coming in. That's how I'd work that deal. Everything is negotiable. It's you got to like try to. And, you know, we don't know what happened with that deal. If he tried negotiating different stuff, I'm sure something I'm sure something of that sort was happening. But you got to try to fight for, you know, fight for your worth, fight for, you know, try to work with both. Because, I mean, Beatport, that's a pretty solid Pretty solid company. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, again. Can I just give their contact information, please? <laughs> just get it out here. I got the show. Please. I can write it. Yeah. Just yeah. A little check, just a little check of like 100K would help us out in our raising our $750,000 goal. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, but yeah, I couldn't. I was like, wow. That's so, so monetizing. So you guys um have, you guys have, have you primarily focused on, uh, getting sponsors is that where you're monetizing the most i see i know you guys have a, a like a subscription membership model as well on the on the site which i'm very interested in that because the membership model can be i mean you see artists with patreons and i think oh, i think a lot of artists should have patreons it's just i think not a lot of them know what to do for content so they feel like it's not worth the value and they don't promote it as much but it's a, anyways i'm digressing but you guys have the member you have the membership model and you guys have uh you have uh you obviously take donations and then you've got um uh sponsors which would you say is going is providing you the most amount of value and monetization and what should i mean i guess it's different for everyone but what would you suggest for an independent artist it's a great question because at the core the fundamental core of the dj session was to always make the content free to the end user. Mm -hmm. No pay-per-views, no, I mean, you don't have to sign up to get a membership to watch this content. You don't even have to have a membership to watch the exclusive content. We have planned things that they get in addition to that of being yeah. a member. You're adding additional value for the value they're giving to you. We would never charge a member to watch a show, but we may give a member an exclusive mm -hmm. of beyond with the content we're churning saying you get first look yeah. at this. 
Um, but it's eventually going to go out to all the masses for right, free anyways. Right. And you might get, a, it might be a 24 hour, you yeah. know, it might be, a, it might even be a 12 hour. Hey, we just released this. You got 12 hours before it goes live to see it before anyone else. Um, something like maybe something like that, but it's always been driven to get sponsors mm-hmm. because that's, that's what's going to make the show sustainable. Um, a lot of people, what's happening right now is you're seeing the well dry up of the donation, the Patreon. The Patreon is another model that I believe is phenomenal. But the PayPal donations, even the Twitch subscribers, you know, Twitch takes at your bottom tier. When you make affiliate and you can start monetizing this, Twitch takes a cut of that. Yeah. And you only get two tiers. You get the $5 model and the $25 model. They take 50% of that. And it's until you get to tier two, then it goes 60, 40. Then tier three, it goes 70, 30. I don't think they even give you any payouts until you make your first like $100 or something. Yeah. So when you can get subscribers, you're still not making money. I think it's until you get like your first five or first 20 subscribers, I think is when they'll be like, okay, now we'll start issuing, issuing you a check. Yep, exactly. And they, I'll tell you, man, they got, they got that shit down. They got that science down. I, and I would not try to build again. I would not try to build our brand off of our subscriber base. Yeah, we're relying on that because again, that's great, but one person can only subscribe to so many shows. Yes, mm-hmm. especially in this time when people are out of work. Now it was all cool to get the donation based model. Hey, we're raising money. We're raising money. Oh, I'll give ten bucks here. But eventually, it becomes a self defeating thing because people say, "Well, I already gave my look. I'll give you case in point. Number one station. I love them. An internet radio station. Been listening to them for seventeen years." Love them. It's my go-to. You come over to my house, you're going to be listening to Groove Salad by Soma FM. Okay? No matter what, I will preach this. Well, if I had to die and was placed on an island, <laughs> three things uh, Three things you'd give me. You'd get my Persol sunglasses, you'd get me my king-size Stearns and Foster bed, and you'd give me Groove Salad. If I had to be stuck on an entire an <sighs> island in purgatory, that's, that's what you'd have to give me. And I'd say, okay, I'll sell. I'll take those three things. I'm cool. <laughs> Cool. As long as it's grew salad. But my point that I'm trying to make is over the years, and I wish I could give more, but I've only donated to the station maybe four, I think three from my recollection, maybe four or five times. I know three for sure, but three times over the year. Or even You're making CD9, a great point here. Our, our local station, because I already feel I've given to them. Yeah. Now they are one of the world's largest number one down tempo ambient stations in the world. And Rusty comes on all the time. Big Earl comes on. But Rusty comes on. He does his pledge thing. But it's commercial free, listener supported music from Soma FM. Gosh, I should have that damn thing memorized by now. And, um, you know, Rusty comes on. It's like the pledge. Drive. He even says, hey, you can give a dollar a month. You can give a one time a 50. And this is what you get. And you get different things for different packages, which is cool. Um, but just keeping that alive. And, and, yeah, people feel when they give the one donation, I already gave. You know, and, and, and but the Patreon model comes in and it's that regular reoccurring, yeah. Yeah. you know, and you can set that up with PayPal too. Now yes. to do reoccurring subscriptions, which is nice, which if you do look at the model, this is a big, uh, big point that we've talked about too, in some other forum with people, what is the best way if you want to directly support an artist, the best method to do it all on where nobody takes a cut PayPal. Mm-hmm. PayPal is at like two and a half, I think two point, maybe two point nine percent. It's just a small transaction fee, is what you. But and and you know some people, for, especially in the in the studio space with mixing and mastering, which is what I do, a lot of studio owners, a lot of engineers, you know, they they fret over the the PayPal fee. But you got to realize that that fee that you're paying for is a it's a convenient. Think of it as a convenience fee. You're making it so much easier for people to give you money. When someone wants to give you money, it should be as frictionless as possible. There should be zero friction. And that's the nice thing about PayPal. Most people have PayPal accounts. If you don't, doesn't matter. Enter your card in, boom, paid, you're good to go. If they do, if they do, they literally just have to log in real quick, hit send, and it's done. Frictionless. It takes less than 30 seconds. I have on our website, and when we do our events, out in public, I have a QR code. People just yeah. put their phone right up to it. It goes boop, takes it right to our donation page. If they're already logged in, it's already yeah. boop, boop. They choose it's the me. amount. Five, it's, it's, uh, I think I have five, 10, 20 other, and boom. The quick and easy thing is so damn important. So obviously the sponsorship model is probably going to the, be the best one. And 
you know, I, there's a reason for that. And I think uh, uh, most of us can agree. I know, Darren, you can agree with this. We want to provide value to our audience as much as possible. And providing free shows, free live shows is one of the best values you can add. And then, you know, majority of the rest of the value is added during the live show, which is how you're differentiating yourself and talking to the crowd and interacting with them. So let's say that these there's producers and DJs out there that want to start live streaming and they're thinking about going to somewhere like Twitch or Facebook or YouTube. How can are you allowed to have sponsors on those live shows on those platforms? Can you announce them? How does that kind of look? It's your own stream. Okay. I mean, they can't tell you and they have no access to your books or your records or what you put in your content. The only thing, and we'll, to, we'll touch on this, you better have your freaking copyright licenses. Yes. That's this what they the care next, about. Yeah. This is the um, next Other than that, the content about. that you put in there, the content you put in there is your own. If you don't have the right to stream the content, you're going to be in a very big world. And I'll tell you what. Especially with sponsors. Put, any smart sponsor is going to ask that question. Do you have your licensing secured for the music? Because they, one, don't want to invest a bunch of money in a show that's going to be pulled offline. Two, possibly be named in a lawsuit for bankrolling said show. Case in point, when I talked to Twitch to go back up to the front page of their site, they said, uh, yeah, Darren, in order to do that, we're going to need to make sure you have licensing for the songs you're using to put you to the front page because then we are actively promoting a show with music in it and if you have the licensing we're all good to do that i said okay great i can get that no problem he said but here's a problem you have 400 videos on our site yeah. that are all red flagged that don't have licensing for them you didn't do that so you they could go back and go look at those 450 videos and i went oh shit and so then they said, not only that, they can go back to your website and they can hit you for that. And I said, nah, don't worry about my website. I'm taking care of there. Yeah. Worry about the live stream and worry about it on your platform. You let me yeah. worry about it on my, you don't, cause that's yeah. no, none of Twitch's business at mm -hmm. all. What lives on my website over there. So I recently had to go back and pull down all of my video on demand on Twitch because they're all red flagged and people do not know what's coming down the line. I so, know what's coming down the line. Okay. Yeah. Which, so which, which, which we'll finish up with sponsorships first. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right yeah. In that. But sponsors are going to want to know that security. And you're going to have to have your brand, a tight brand. I'm not just talking about a website and a show once a week and thinking, I got a brand and I'm worth money now because I can do this. No, you're going to have to have comp consistency, competency, doing something different. I mean, you've got to be out there, professionalism. You got to know, and you got to know your contract. You got to know your shit when it comes to this. Okay. And the average person, if, if people start tooting a horn out there, I could see right through it and go, Okay, great. Like I had some dude throw me some shade the other day in a group. And this is funny because I had did some, there's some, some websites you can go to check on stat for a site. And uh, we came in and when I first checked it, we were at like number 12,000. I was like, when I first saw that, I was like, bummer, man, we're only 12,000 in the world. Eh. I went to my friend Monty and he goes, uh, who we're working on with Compound Records, got a bunch of big stuff coming out, Waterland Arcade, Attack the Block, check it out. December 15th, launching a whole new series. Anyways, same as same as self promotion there. But Monty, I love you. And um, but this is what he said to me. He goes, Darren, if there were a million basketball players in the world and you were ranked number 12,000, you're number 12,000 out of a million. Yeah. And that just put it into perspective for me, going, whoa. There's probably hundreds of millions of webs websites, maybe I'd tens say, of millions. Well, I mean, we're talking, we're not talking web, we're talking live streamers. Live oh, channels. live stream. This okay. Is directly okay. to live. This gotcha. is directly gotcha. your Twitch ranking, basically. Oh, your Twitch ranking. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah, probably, like we're number 12, a lot of streamers I'm, on there. I'm guesstimating now, let's lowball, say 20 million, probably 40. Yeah. Million, be more. So yeah. I, I'm like, gosh, we're 12,000 out of 20 million. I'll take that's it. Huge. That's, your, that's it. top 1%. Yeah. So then the other day, I went back and checked it, and we were at 11,000. And then I came back a day later, a couple of weeks later, and we were at 9,600. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. So some dude throws some shade at me in a group the other day because I was talking in the group. And, and we've been doing a lot of back-end development. Like, we're, we're mm -hmm. waiting to move stuff forward. So I know our move. I know my chessboard very well. Yeah. Put it that way. What yeah. we're doing to make calculated moves and make this stuff happen. The guy comes in kind of attacking me. Oh, you're really not that big of a channel. You're only like number 22,000 in the world. 
blah, 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 blah. blah, 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 blah. You'd have way more if you were. I go, hey, thanks for checking on my stats. I need to go update that and check on that anyways. But um, you do realize there's about 20 million streamers in the world, which puts us in the top 1% of streamers. Oh, and here's a picture of us that a few weeks ago, where we're actually at 9,600, putting us at the 0.05% of the world. So bingo. Yeah. Yeah. With that. Um, Yeah, I didn't hear back from (laughs) trying to trying to troll me in a chat room. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that ain't going to work here. I ain't going to fly, buddy. Yeah. Have a nice day. So that being said, that's what sponsors are going to want to see. Yeah. You want to see the screenshot. Like when we were doing, when we were doing the freak stream episode, we were number five Mm -hmm. and we take a screenshot of that. So we can go back to sponsors going, look, we're ranking number five. I know what buttons, I know what buttons to push with what we're doing right now to keep us at number five. Think if I could keep us constantly at number five with 12 episodes, 12 filmings a month, which we're now looking to upgrade with at least a minimum of two more. So there's Mm -hmm. 14. I'm going into a development deal later this week to do another four. So we're looking at 18, possibly 20 filmings, tapings a month at a minimum of four hours per taping of 80 hours of content a month. What happens, let's just round that up to let's say we're doing 100 hours a month and somebody is giving us $10,000 a month Okay, that becomes what a hundred dollars they're paying for every episode, and we also have the truck where we can put their advertising yeah. on the truck as we drive yeah. around. Okay, this content is being viewed by thousands, and we have the video on demand where the commercial is burnt into the episode mm-hmm. and stays there yeah. forever. It's not a pay per click that goes away. So they're getting residual value for years to come. Yep. Yep. Five years down the line, their commercial is still in that show Mm -hmm. that's on our website that's searchable that being said that's what sponsors are going to track that's what they're going to look for and if we don't have even we don't have the money to catapult us to that realm you have to have all this infrastructure built when everyone jumped on the live streaming platform even years before the live streaming thing was so it i can do this in my sleep probably walk into a room blindfolded my hands you ever see the guy who assembles the gun blindfolded doesn't like 20 seconds or 10 seconds or seven seconds like puts it all together the gun's ready there and goes ready mm-hmm. to fire and pops up the clip and pops up the bullet or whatever. That's me with live stream. That's, that's not, I can do that in my sleep backwards up on the stand on my head. But I positioned myself by doing it for so long to build that brand, to make it ready packaged to go sponsor can come and write a check and go with confidence. Here's 50 K. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to look back $4,000 a month with the amount of content you're producing. Okay. There's a hundred episodes. You mean I'm paying $50 per episode to have my commercial running that a minimum yeah. of four to five times. I'm listening on your website. I'm in your social media branding. I'm on your newsletters. I'm on the side of your truck. I'm on your banners when you're out doing events. It's huge. I'm doing, and, and this is just Seattle, by the way. That's 50 grand. I can duplicate this in multiple markets and, and have sub chapters and have chapters in other markets. And we were getting ready with one of our sponsors earlier this year. We were in talks with an alcohol sponsor, alcohol and beverage sponsor. And the first conversation went like this. Hey, Darren, can you take your truck out to different parks and beaches with a street team? Because I own an advertising company as well mm-hmm. that does the mobile billboard trucks and street teams. And all. And they, they said, can you take your truck out and do street teams and at the beaches to promote our new alcohol brand? I said, I got one better for you. I can put DJs in the back of the truck. And your street teams go out and have music playing for the truck. But on top of that, I can do silent disco events and have it be a multiple event with that's multiple true. DJs. Oh, and then I can live stream all those stages live over the internet and put your branding in all the shows. They went, that's cool for Seattle. Awesome. About a week later, this is early this year. I said to myself, I'm thinking about getting out of Seattle and I want to take a road trip. I want to take the truck on the road trip, which we can talk maybe in another episode about the freeway <laughs> session. Kevin Smith talked about it prominently in a show of his years ago. It's pretty cool. I'll talk about that later. But um, we we're gonna. I was just gonna, like, let's take the truck, get out of Dodge and go to some other cities and do something. That Monday, I mean, I had that idea Monday at nine o'clock. At 11 o'clock in the morning, they called me up and said, hey, Darren, can you go to other cities with the idea? I said, absolutely, we can. I believe that's so serendipitous that this just happened. And then they said, okay, well, if you can do Seattle and Portland, could you go nationwide with this if you wanted to? And I said, yes. The next week, I'm not only on the phone with their West Coast marketing director, they have their East Coast marketing director. He's signing off on the idea. We're looking at 12 to 15 markets. It grew into not only doing us that plan of what we're going to do for Seattle and Portland, doing it in all major cities. But they also wanted us to book A-list celebrity DJs to perform yeah. at each of the stops that we did as well. Crazy. We were looking Oof. at probably, I say, low ball on the deal. 
But just this one sponsor, we were looking at anywhere from 180 to 250. And it was going to be all done in like four months. And I that was just to go one way around the nation. I wasn't planning a return trip, which we could have taken right. a break and then did the whole return circuit on the way back, hitting the cities double. So it could have been a 360 to a half million dollar contract we were negotiating. That's the kind of level of shit that I'm into. So when somebody yeah. comes to me and they're, I mean, love every streamer online, love everything that everyone's doing. But if you're out there and donations are the way you're doing it and you're raising a hundred bucks here and 200 bucks there, you're not even in the realm of understanding what the costs to truly do this are. And I tell people, look, a webcam, a webcam from your bedroom is great. Donations is great. Building your channel is great. But when I go out, I was talking with somebody a few, a couple of years ago, and I told them what my rates were to actually take me on site at a nightclub and shoot what I would charge a client to do this. And they balked at me when I told them, yeah, minimum cost would be about 3,500 bucks for a nighttime production. They go, what? No nightclub could ever afford that. No promoter could ever afford that. Your rates are way too high. I go, go get three quotes from any reputable company in town. Okay. I'm bringing $20,000 worth of gear. I'm bringing 26 years of film and television, broadcast, podcast, live streaming knowledge to the team. I'm bringing a Twitch featured partner channel. Okay. I'm bringing all of that. I'm there from nine o'clock at night till four in the morning. It's a 10 hour production. Okay. And that's what I charge. Yes, I know. And this is what I said back. I said, that's why I don't shoot in nightclubs anymore. Because <laughs> yeah. you're right. They're not yeah. my target demographic. They're yeah, not my they target can't. audience. Yeah. I'll build my own studio. And I'll add that intrinsic value or what's called goodwill on the accounting side. If you look at the goodwill that the DJ Sessions has alone over the past 10 years, goodwill, mm -hmm. if I had to ascertain everything, and if most people don't know what, if you don't know what goodwill is, goodwill is the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into a company. You can assign a dollar value to that to value your company. I was sitting at a poker game last year with a couple of my friends. And the guy said, good friend of mine, knows a lot of people. He comes in. So basically, long story short, he says, we're at the poker table. And he wasn't trying to bluff me or anything, but we're sitting there with another friend. Right? They both know me. And their friend who's sitting over here, he doesn't know me. And my friend Gary looks at me. He goes, Darren, you do a lot of work. I know a lot of entrepreneurs in my life. He knows all the restaurant. I mean, he just bought the Queen Anne Beer Hall, which I'll announce here as one of our new sponsors for the show. <laughs> we're really excited for that. Um, but uh, Pike Brewing Company used to be the general manager there. And now he's, uh, now he's with um, Queen Anne Beer Hall as one of the owners. But um, he looks at me across the table and says, with all the work you put in, 10 years, doing your show, I know the entrepreneur, how much would you sell your brand for? About, what, one, 1. 1.5? Sit there, I cry at the table. I go, I laugh. I go, take a sip of my drink. And I go, try probably about 15. Jesus. No, now that I think about it, probably 25. Because he asked me the question, he did ask me a question, to sell out and never be able to do this ever again. I forgot to add that caveat. 1.5, to sell out, never do it again. You walk away. Boom, you're out of the game. I said, no, 15. No, make that probably about 25. My friend that knows me very well across the table, he looks and goes, hmm. Gary goes, huh, I didn't expect a number that high. The kid's sitting here, he's like, like fuck, $25 million. Who the fuck am I sitting with at the table right now? Yeah. I'm like, I'm not that's a big, I'm not trying to toot a horn or say that's big, but you got to look at it. If, if you just valued it at to sell me out of the game and never be able to do this again, I'm going to retire. 25 million. But even if you just put in, if it was baseline, a quarter million a year of work that would be put in a value about this over 10 years, that's $2.5 million. I'm not going to sell out for my baseline to never be able to do this again. Right, right. Yeah. You know, and the value of it, mm -hmm. that's just no way, shape, or form. No. Not when I know I'm sitting on, I mean, even though my target goal for 2020 was to raise a quarter million dollars just for Seattle. That's still a small number to act. That's just the baseline that I actually do it for just Seattle alone to pay people and the staff and everything that I'd want on board 750 without breaking a sweat, without breaking a sweat. And I mean, that would take out, let's just say for me comfortably as an executive producer, taking out 150 a year just for me as executive mm -hmm. producer. I mean, that's a decent wage, I would say. Mm -hmm. Even 100 grand would be. That's great. It's a lot of people would love that. I would love that. It's, it's all the hard work I'm putting in, you know, no mm -hmm. big deal there. Okay. But then you got to look at, okay, all the production, the marketing. I mean, marketing on that alone would probably be easily another marketing and back end licensing on it. We'd probably be looking at another 350, probably half yeah. the cost would be marketing and licensing. Oh, yeah. All that shit. And that would still leave me left over with out of 750, that would still only leave me with $250,000. So I might be able to bring on a, a full time person at 50, 60 grand a year. That's my right hand person. I might be able to bring on a couple staffers, 
part time at 30 grand a year. And then we got a little bit of petty cash to play around with some shit. This is exactly this is exactly why donations don't work. <laughs> Patreon. Exactly. Thank you for bringing that all the way back to the that's why donations will not work. And people will get disenfranchised, burnt out and wonder why their own fans they, they keep going, give us money, give us money. And they mm -hmm. keep seeing the same person in the chat room. And that person is going to say, I already gave you money. I already yeah, gave you money. Yeah. And I'm watching it for free. And that person, they'll get, and they'll be like, Ugh, I can't, I gave you what I could give you. I, I'm here in the chat room, aren't I? Aren't I helping yeah. your viewership? Like, yeah. Nope. And it's, it's a self defeating model in the long run, unless you're getting new people every single If you're getting a new thousand people every show, okay, new thousand, new thousand, new thousand, and you're getting, but it's not going to pay for the real bill, the real right. cost to do this right. and real what's going to propel you to the top. And um, so that being said, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. So we've got about 10, 10 ish minutes left. I love that, though. I mean, it's a great it's a great reason for why something like sponsors is so much more realistic and it's going to probably benefit you a lot more. But let's you have get to be positioned for that, though. Yeah, exactly. You have to be positioned. Yes. And you can't just say I have the idea. So give me money. It's yeah. not going to work like no. that. No. I, I have a lot of people that do what's called the verbal pitch to me. Even my mom back in 2001 came and they do the verbal pitch. Hey, you're the producer. You got the backing. I got the idea for the show. Everything's yeah. 50, 50. Okay, do you have any money to produce this? Yeah. Well, no, you're the producer. I, I was there. Mm -hmm. they go, I got the idea for the show. You're the production company. I'm pitching the idea. You should pick me up and you do all the work and put all the money <laughs> on it. No, I know we don't. I know we're going to step into a subject here that I think we're going to get into. I was going to suggest, can we make it a part two episode? I know I was like a full hour. Long. It might be more beneficial for us because we're going to dive into copyright. And I was going to say, like, we've got 10 minutes left and copywriting is going to be a huge one. But we might need to make this a part two because it I mean, copyright is such a big one uh, in today's world. So. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Let's plan to make a part two so all of the listeners don't miss out on part two because that's probably going to be so much more important for you to get a grasp on the copyright side. It's going to save you a lot of headaches um, and won't fuck you over. It's something that could actually fuck you over in life completely. It, so it's, it's something that people are not taking. I, I Like I said, I had to give somebody a breakdown for it. First DJ, brought him on as resident. He had to hear me do the nonstop copyright speech of explaining it all to him. And I tried to do it as best I could in about 12 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. But it opens up about 15 other more questions, which yes. turns into an hour to two hour long conversation. And, and once you explain it, you go, wow. And there is no there is no around. This is not subject to, well, that's your opinion, Darren. Mm -hmm. This is what is in the black and white, how it runs. And unfortunately, it's not changing. There's no, it's not on a, a political, any political agenda well, right now. If anything is going to change, it's just going to get more restricted, especially with how like the internet, we're now in this age of, we kind of have a grasp on this thing of the internet now, because we have that grasp, things are rapidly changing every day with the way we use the internet. And because of that, things are going to, I mean, with streaming alone, that made a huge hiccup in the industry of of just paying artists so um it, it, it's i i'm sure it's going to change even more with as live streaming progresses and becomes bigger and bigger i can tell you that the youtube dust is in a sense settled podcast dust is kind of in a sense settled but what just happened nine months ago again the world couldn't predict it of everything being shut down everyone yeah. being at home i mean a podcast growth alone i've seen some stats from a podcast magazine the podcast steve Olshare. And uh, he says there used to be a million podcasts in the world pre-COVID. This year alone, now there's 1.6 million. So there's been a doubling growth. If you look at Twitch's stats, what the growth has happened this year alone of everyone Dude. going, I mean, just boom. And Twitch is running 90% of the world's online live streaming content right now. Yeah. Mixer, so Mixer, owned by Face by Microsoft, sold over to Facebook. Facebook, owned, you're going to see a big thing come out of Facebook here. You mentioned, I think they're big kickoff. Personally, my, my prediction is, is that Facebook's going to kick off with a huge Oculus campaign. They're going to make yeah. Oculus a, play, a, a form that goes up against PlayStation, up against Xbox, and they're going to go boom, and they're going to drop. They're going to figure out a way to drop the price point on it so we can all put it in our homes. Because right now, I heard a stat the other day, there's only about 14 million Oculus users out there. They need that number to be a critical mass where they're yeah. going to have 100 million Oculus users. Out yep. there. How are they going to put this on the store for Christmas? 
2021. How are people going to buy it without having to buy a, a two thousand dollar computer to run their Oculus out of their home? Mm-hmm. All those things that they're going to work on. It has to be made like the Nintendo eight bit Nintendo price point has to drop down to a hundred bucks. They're starting to do that with like the Oculus Quest, which is kind of the you don't need a computer to do that. It's a little bit cheaper, and I think they just gave uh like they just released an update or something where you can now connect it to your computer if you want. So you're already seeing like the price of the Oculus drive drop drastically and there's i mean that in and of itself could be an entire episode talking about live streaming and vr which is starting to become a big thing and it's it's getting crazy but darren i gotta get going here thank you so much for coming on the show dude plug away what what do you so this episode this is actually going to be a special episode because it's coming out on christmas day on the 25th so for all you people who celebrate christmas Merry Christmas. I know I'm right now spending time with family as you guys are listening to this episode on Christmas. But Darren, what do you guys have going on at the DJ sessions? What would you like to plug? Um, And then we'll get a part two scheduled and up and running, hopefully around the new year. Absolutely. Uh, The first thing I would like to let all our viewers know is go to our website, thedjsessions.com. All the information about our shows are there, our past episodes. Hopefully we're trying to break our 2000th episode in by the end of this year. It may just happen right after the first year. It might be our, actually our New Year's series that we're producing in the nice. truck, driving around Seattle, spreading that New Year's joy, which might become the 2000th episode to be released. That'd be awesome. 10 years. And yeah, it'd be just, it's a milestone. But everything we have there is at our site, the djsessions.com. Follow our event calendar because that'll show you what our shows are, what our resident shows are, what's coming up, whether you're local or around the world. All that information is on our site. Uh, and then definitely go and follow us on all our socials. They're right there on the site as well. Uh, actually, follow us on Twitch so you'll be notified when we go live. Everything is at the DJ Sessions, forward slash the DJ Sessions, at mention the DJ Sessions, hashtag the DJ Sessions. Uh, except for our Facebook, it's ITV Live, the DJ Sessions. <laughs> but you'll find us. Go to our website and uh, you know follow us. Donate, become a member, all that fun stuff. We can use your support. Uh, even though we are looking for sponsors, we do have awesome stuff for our members. That if you do sign up for as little as four dollars a month or fifty bucks a year, you can become a DJ Sessions member. Every little bit helps right now um, to help keep our mission going and help support our endeavors. Uh, you're going to see a ton of content coming out for 2021. Right now, our regular schedule is Saturdays and Sundays uh, and Wednesdays. We're launching a new Tuesday series. We possibly have a new, whole new one year series, a, a one year contract coming up to produce four more shows a month, uh, weekly shows. So we're looking at anywhere from 14 to 20 days of production a month coming out, all churning out electronic music. We have A-list celebrity appearances, A-list celebrity interviews coming down the line. We're really excited for what's going on. And then, you know, if you watch the uh, Freak Stream episodes, we're actually uh, building the studio out even better to add more studio is for the sick. Buck to, to, that, to the R90 lighting studios that will definitely rival or give you the bang for your buck. If you like the Insomniac productions of Live Nation productions of what you're seeing them do out there with their stage presence, the LED panels and all that, follow us. That's coming in for 2021. Love it. Awesome. And I'll have all of the links for all the stuff we talked about in this episode for you guys at the show notes, nbsaudio.com slash episode. I think this is 43 now. It's getting up there. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting, I got to do something. I'm doing something big for the 50th episode coming up. I'm not sure. Probably maybe doing a whole live stream episode. I don't know. I don't know. Plays right into white. Yeah, plays into right what we're talking about here. So we'll see. I, I got to figure something out. But Darren, thank you so much again. I appreciate it. We're going to get a part two in. We're going to be talking about copywriting stuff. I can't wait. But yeah, sweet. Talk to you later, man. Talk to you soon. Hey, guys. Thanks for checking out today's episode. As always, head to enviousaudio.com slash episode 43 to check out the show notes. If you're struggling with mixing or mastering, go ahead and head on over to enviousaudio.com. Check out my portfolio and reach out to me. Fill out my contact form. Let me know what you're struggling with. If you like the show or if you hate the show, go to Apple Podcasts, rate and review it, share it with a friend. Let me know what you think. Head to Electronic Dance Money. Actually, no, sorry. Just go ahead and look up the Electronic Dance Money community on Facebook. Join it there. I was actually just talking to my girlfriend today. I think I'm going to start doing some live streams of like premiering the episodes in there on Friday evenings. So if you want more news about that, go ahead and join the Facebook group and you'll start seeing me posting events in there or something uh, where we'll be doing the live streamed 
events. You can hang out, ask questions. I'll be there chilling. But anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I'll see you next time for part two. Take care.